By the way, somebody asked me yesterday if my cat is dead. He's, he's, he's okay, trust me. Cost me a fortune to move to Australia as well. Too. Okay, uh, hello again, everybody. My name's Ollie J. Um, I'm at the University of Sydney in Australia, and I um, was formerly at the University of Ottawa, which is when I actually conducted this work in collaboration with the University of South Florida in Tampa and uh, the University of, uh, of Connecticut. And I'm going to talk to you today about exploring the individual factors that elevate the risk of heat-related illness in American football summer training camps. I recognize that probably a lot of people in the audience, uh, notwithstanding our American colleagues, are probably not too familiar with, uh, with American football, so I'll try to uh, talk through some of the basics in terms of the positional specifics and things like that. Okay, so um, American football is a very, uh, very popular participation sport in the United States, um, particularly at the youth level. Um, at the Pop Warner level or at the, um, at the, uh, the junior level, uh, we have over 250,000 participants. And then high school, there's over a, hundred, uh, over a million people who take part in high school football. As we go up to the more elite levels, when we get to the college level, there are around about 70,000 players. And uh, that's across around about 650 NCAA college teams. And the number of teams in the NCAA are actually increasing uh, every year. Then eventually we get to the, the elite, elite level, which is uh, the National Football League, which I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with. And uh, there are 32 NFL teams uh, with a total of 1,696 players. Irrespective of the level that people are playing at, um, they all have pre-season summer training camps. Uh, these always take place in, uh, towards the end of July or the start of August. Um, the NFL ones start at the end of July, typically. Uh, the high school and college ones start uh, a little later at the start of August. However, these are very competitive environments um, because people are typically trying to make either a squad to actually make the team or, um, or they're trying to uh, battle for a spot on, on, on the depth chart on a, on a particular team. And in the case of professionals, this could be the difference between making a lot of money and making no money whatsoever. The average annual salary of an NFL player is $1.9 million. So obviously the motivation for people to do very well is very, very high. Um, there's also uh, a significant heat stress associated with American football activities during that time of year, during the summer training camps. This is a schematic of the United States, and you can see basically is that uh, ambient temperature, this is the average temperature uh, during the first week of August in 2010, which is actually when we did our field study for what I'm going to talk about today. Um, ambient temperature is above 30 degrees Celsius in pretty much uh, uh, every place across the United States, with the exception of, of so very, very, very few places. Um, the, the, uh, the green dots on here actually represent the locations of the summer training camps of each of the 32 NFL teams on that particular year. And you can see that a lot of them take place in very, very warm environments. So typically, air temperatures are above 30 degrees Celsius. For those of you who saw my talk yesterday and a lot of other things that we've talked about, um, uh, we know that high ambient temperature will reduce your ability to dissipate heat to the environment via the dry heat transfer processes of convection. Associated with these high ambient temperatures are also high radiant temperatures. So globe temperature will exceed 40 degrees Celsius in many cases. A good rule of thumb at this time of year, uh, my colleague Tom Bernard down in, uh, down in Tampa told me that uh, a good rule of thumb when, it's, when there is no cloud cover, that globe temperature will be typically 8 degrees Celsius higher than ambient temperature during uh, the, uh, the peak um, uh, daytime hours. Uh, on top of uh, these uh, limitations to dry heat loss and actually a dry heat load when we've got high radiant temperatures um, is also a high ambient humidity. So typically these will be around about in the order of 50 to 60 uh, percent relative humidity. Obviously the absolute humidity is what determines the evaporation of, of sweat from the skin, but uh, when we normalize it for air temperature, it's typically around 50 to 60 uh, percent relative humidity. So obviously there's a big thermal stress imposed. An additional thermal stress imposed to a typical American football player is the standard issue uniform that they will wear. So for, for those of you who are not familiar with the, with the uniform, I'll just describe it briefly. We have a helmet, as well worn on head, obviously, and we have uh, shoulder pads that are worn over the shoulders, but also they have uh, breastplates as well. So these shoulder pads come over the front of the chest and actually impede uh, heat loss quite significantly over the upper part of the torso. They also have a back plate as well, and different configurations of shoulder pads can actually go a little further down as well, covering a higher surface area. Um, we also have a, uh, an arrangement of soft padding, tailbone and hip pads, and also thigh pads and knee pads. So uh, we know that the, uh, the barrier to evaporative 
uh, cooling or evap evaporation of sweat from the skin is quite significant with this particular football ensemble. And this was actually uh, defined by a, a great paper by uh, Liz McCullough and Larry Kenny uh, in MSSC in 2003, where they defined it uses the, the rapid resistance of an American football ensemble using a mannequin. And they found that the evaporative resistance is between two and three times greater than a reference ensemble of a, a T-shirt and shorts. So clearly, there's quite a, a big a burden on these players to maintain their core temperature. With all, these, uh, with all this knowledge, uh, it's probably quite, uh, quite obvious or not a big surprise that uh, heat-related illnesses and uh, heat exhaustion is, is a big problem in American football. Um, 123 players have died of heat-related deaths in high school between 1960 and 2009. That might not sound an awful lot of people, but this is notwithstanding of the thousands of people who have experienced heat, uh, heat exhaustion and heat illness as well. And some of those probably, uh, there's probably higher than the ones that are reported as well. And what's more alarming is that the death rate uh, of, of players, particularly at the junior level, uh, has doubled in the last 15 years. Um, the most prominent death uh, associated with American football is that of Corey Stringer. This is a picture of Corey Stringer here. He uh, was a 145-kilogram uh, offensive lineman for the Minnesota Vikings. And uh, during the second day of training camp, uh, which was on the 1st of August in 2001, he succumbed to heat stroke and died. Uh, when he reached the hospital, uh, his core temperature was up to 42 degrees Celsius. The ambient conditions that day were 32 degrees Celsius and 65% relative humidity. But the question that we want to ask ourselves is that Corey was one of 100 players on the field on that particular day, doing presumably very similar activities, wearing similar gear, exposed to the same environment. So what was it that led to Corey Stringer getting extremely high core temperatures, which is probably one of the contributing factors to him uh, passing away? One thing we do know is that Offensive linemen and defensive linemen, these are the bigger players, tend to demonstrate higher changes in core temperature during summer training camps. These are data from uh, a, a study by Godek et al. And they actually got in with the Philadelphia Eagles um, in the mid-2000s. And uh, they measured their core temperature throughout a typical training camp. And they divided their players into the large offensive and defensive linemen, and then what we call backs. That's really basically everybody else, linebackers, receivers, cornerbacks, and I'll describe that in the next slide for those of you not familiar with the positions. What they found is that the elevation in core temperature in the linemen is much greater, and irrespective of the different type of drills they were doing at the particular time, the elevation in core temperature was greater in these linemen. So the question is, what is it about these linemen that results in their higher changes in core temperature? Just give you a bit of... Uh, lowdown on what linemen actually are. This is a typical lineup of an American football um, game. Uh, this is the offense, it's Dallas Cowboys, I think. This is the defense, I don't know who that is. Uh, uh, Indianapolis Colts, I think. And uh, the, the, the linemen are basically the large guys in the middle who are down in a three-point stance. And uh, they do a lot of heavy isometric exercise, and they basically push each other a lot. These guys try to get, get hold of the, uh, the person who's carrying the ball. And these guys try to stop them or create holes for the ball carrier to then uh, proceed downfield. We classify these as linemen and everybody else as being backs. So we have the Quarterback here, running back, wide receivers, uh, linebackers, and then people in the secondary, which are cornerbacks and safeties. So the first question is that maybe these larger players are succumbing to or, or demonstrating greater changes in core temperature due to the fact that they have, they have a greater level of dehydration. Um, Hydration status has been a uh, big focus of, uh, of health in American football with uh, summer training camps, a uh, courtesy of, of, of Gatorade's Beat the Heat campaign, which has uh, sponsored um, the NFL's um, uh, uh, policies over the last few years. So hydration is actually something that they really focus on uh, quite a lot. And what they actually found, this is back to the data of Godek et al., they found that, remember, the linemen were the guys that got a lot hotter, but they actually were better hydrated and the levels of dehydration weren't anything beyond that 2% of total body mass that Dr. Sorka was talking about yesterday. So it doesn't seem that dehydration per se is the, the, the culprit for these high elevations in core temperature in the large alignment. So the next question is, maybe it's to do with how big they are. This is maybe an, a nice little uh, picture that illustrates the uh, extreme differences between your large lineman, which is a big fella right there, and your smaller non lineman or backs. So they differ greatly between position. You could probably even see that on the previous slide I showed. They differ greatly in body mass, uh, body surface area, and uh, body fat percentage. And they also probably have differences in aerobic fitness, secondary to the fact that they're so much greater, so, so much larger. 
So the question is, do these differences in bottom morphology lead to differences in human heat balance? Maybe the linemen are getting hotter because they're producing more heat. Or perhaps the linemen are getting hotter because they're losing less heat. Or maybe it's both. So this is something that we really wanted to uh, investigate further. So I was fortunate enough to uh, obtain as a, as a, as a co-in, uh, as a co-principal investigator, a, uh, a grant from the, the uh, National Football League uh, Charities, which is an NFL medical research grant. And uh, I teamed up with um, Dr. Eric Corris of the University of South Florida and Dr. Doug Kasser of the uh, Corey Stringer Heat Stress Institute, who's at the um, University of Connecticut. And uh, we did uh, a work with uh, the, uh, the NCAA uh, USF uh, football team. And this is there. So they're, they're pretty much at an elite level. Uh, they compete um, at the highest level in, in, in college sports. And we did this in the summer of, of 2010. So the overall purpose of the, of the portion of the project that I, I led was really to answer the question or try to determine why particular individuals are more susceptible to larger elevations in, in core temperature. And the way that we approached this is that we did two separate studies. We did a lab study where we took players and put them in a controlled environment and controlled the metabolic rate and see if their heat loss responses were compromised. And that was done three weeks before training camp. And then we did a field study where we actually uh, took measurements on the players during the first six days of their summer training camp. And this took place in the first week of August. So just to give you an idea of the athletes that we were dealing with, they were all uh, from the varsity team. The uh, majority of them were starters. One of the guys we actually worked with uh, is now uh, playing for the New York Giants, which is pretty cool. And uh, again, we separate them into linemen and non-linemen or backs. Um, they were very young, well, pretty young, uh, college-aged. And uh, but the thing I want to draw your attention to is the enormous difference in body morphology between these individuals. They really are massive lads, these, uh, these linemen. So you look at the body mass, the average body mass was 142 kilograms and uh, relative to 88 kilograms, which is not exactly a small person on its own, uh, in the backs. And then the body surface area of the offensive line was absolutely enormous. I'd, I've never seen this before myself, I've dealt with it anyway. Uh, around about 2.7 meters squared. To give you an idea, my, my body surface area is around 1.9, 1.8 meters squared. So uh, they're, they're really quite enormous. Um, despite the very large body surface area, the surface area to mass ratio is a lot lower in these linemen. Secondly, the fact that their mass difference is so, much, so, uh, is so great. Another thing worth noting is the fact that they are carrying, out, carrying a lot more subcutaneous fat or, or body fat percentage, whether, where it is, whether it's visceral or, or subcutaneous, we didn't actually measure it. That gives you an idea of the characteristics of the two groups of athletes that we were working with. So the next question is, if we want to compare their sweating response, if we want to know whether their heat loss ability is compromised, because of these large differences in body morphology, how do we prescribe the exercise intensity to make a fair comparison between these really large and relatively smaller guys? So we based this, well, the study was done beforehand, uh, we published in 20, 2012 in MSSE, but um, the, the thought process behind the uh, metabolic rate that we gave them uh, was, 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 was published a little later on. So this is a study that we published in J-Physiol last year uh, in association with, uh, with uh, Glenn Kenny's group, also at the University of Ottawa. And what we demonstrated was that whole, absolute whole body sweat loss is determined by the evaporative heat balance requirements. Uh, that's not really a great surprise. So provided that all of the sweat can evaporate, then um, the, the evaporative, absolute evaporative requirements for heat balance determine how much sweat we produce. We described 93% of the variability in whole body sweat loss. And this is both during, this is the steady state graph, but we also have a non-steady state graph as well. And we get an agreement of over 90% for non-steady state as well. Relative to the percentage of VO2 max, so the relative exercise intensity, really putting a dagger in that idea this week, um, uh, uh, basically with a very poor correlation between relative exercise intensity and whole body sweat loss, thus demonstrating that the heat balance requirements for evaporation determine the whole body sweat losses. However, if we're dealing with people who are very different morphologically, if we take person A, uh, who's the, the, the back, with a body surface area of 2.1 meters squared, and person B with a very large surface area of 2.7 meters squared, if we provide the same metabolic rate, which elicits the same evaporative requirement of heat balance in watts, this would result, theoretically, in a whole body sweat loss of around about 18 grams per minute, which is actually quite high. However, we measure local sweat rate typically over a fixed surface area, either using a ventilated sweat capsule or using a technical absorbent patch. So this is a fixed surface area, and that surface area of that patch or capsule is not altered depending on, on, on the individual that you're, that you're doing. 
So if you normalize this absolute whole body sweat loss for the surface area of the, uh, the capsule, you're going to get systematic differences in the local sweat rate that you measure, not because of the different ability to secrete sweat onto the skin surface, just simply due to confounding morphological factors. Um, this is the data from uh, Matt Kramer's paper that we published in J Physiol just last, last month. And basically what we did is that we figured out a way of, we, we thought that we, if we take the metabolic rate and normalize it for body surface area, this should eliminate the systematic difference in local sweat rate measured with a ventilated sweat capsule. So what we did was a fixed EREC, which is what we, what we found uh, worked for whole body sweat loss in the J Physiol paper in 2013. And then we normalized that metabolic rate, which, is the, which basically gives you the fixed EREC, for body surface area. So we're prescribing exercise intensity in watts per meter squared. And between a very large group and a very small group, there was a 0 0.4, 0 0.3 meter squared difference between these particular individuals. Uh, we eliminate the systematic difference between the large and small people in terms of their, state, of, their, of their sweating response during exercise. And incidentally, we made sure that the onset threshold and thermosensitivity sensitivity of these individuals were identical. So we're isolating the influence of body morphology here. Um, we use a technical absorbent patch. Uh, this just, it was more convenient because we were working in someone else's lab. I actually would, was v very grateful to Tom Bernard who uh, gave me a uh, full run of his lab for two weeks to be able to conduct these experiments down at USF, so I do want to acknowledge him. Um, but we didn't really have the setup for an ventilated sweat capsule. And just in case somebody is wondering whether the ventilated sweat capsule and the technical absorbent match uh, or agree quite well, this is a paper, a methodological paper that I published uh, with my uh, master student, Nate Morris, who's doing his uh, PhD with me in Australia right now. Um, in JP last year in association with George Hadness group at Loughborough and we basically found that the, the local sweat rate uh, measured with the ventilated sweat capsule actually agrees very, very well with the local sweat rate that we measured with technical absorbent simultaneously after 30 and 50 minutes exercise. If anybody's interested in this method, I don't have time to talk about it right now, but I can talk about it further on. Anyway, what do we find? So we fixed the rate of metabolic heat production in watts per meter squared. This elicited the same rate of or, or similar rates of evaporative requirement for heat balance in watts per meter squared. So we should see the same sweat rates between the large and small people if there isn't anything systematically different between them. That is not what we found. What we found is that the linemen actually sweat a lot more. So originally we wondered whether they were sweating less, but they were sweating more on the forehead, on the, on the shoulder, the chest, and the forearm, and the overall average. Only on the lower back did we see no difference. So they're sweating more. However, they got hotter. So they're secreting more sweat onto the skin surface, but they're, not, they're clearly not evaporating it because the change in core temperature for the linemen was actually much greater. In fact, they look uncompensable, and the backs seem compensable. And if we look at the differences in surface area to mass ratio, because we're prescribing exercise intensity per meter squared, the amount of heat production per kilogram is actually a lot lower in the linemen, but they got hotter. So this is strong evidence to suggest that the ability for these linemen to secrete, not just to secrete sweat, sweat on skin surface, that's, that's not a problem, but to subsequently evaporate that sweat to the environment seems to be a big issue for them. So maybe that's because they have a problem achieving a, the same maximum skin wetness as the smaller guys. So the question is, why, why is this? Is it due to the fact that they have greater amounts of fat? Or is it because they have an intrinsically higher body surface area? I think Sheila Dervis's study uh, that she discussed yesterday maybe uh, addresses the fat question. We didn't see any independent influence of fat when we try to isolate it, albeit in a compensable environment. So we are hypothesizing right now, and this requires more work, but we think that maybe the body surface area is responsible for this. So bearing in mind there are very, very large differences in surface area. And these guys that, that the large alignment have surface areas up to 2.7 meters squared. So, the reason that we think this is an issue is because we know from, from Barrow's uh, work back in the 1960s is that the number of sweat glands that we have is pretty much determined by the age of two. And uh, so, so we, it's probably a fair assumption that the absolute number of sweat glands for a lineman and a back is the same. However, because they've got a higher surface area, the, the density of those sweat glands are stretched further and further apart. And we think that what, what happens is that this compromises the ability to actually have the sweat from neighboring sweat glands to merge. So I'll try to describe this in this schematic here. Again, a bit amateurish, so I do apologize. So this is the, sm this is the, the, the backs with the, lower sweat, with the higher sweat gland density with the lower body surface area. The sweat glands are closer together, they secrete sweat, and that sweat, when it comes onto the skin surface, can then merge together with the sweat that's secreted by the neighboring gland, and that will result in full skin wetness. On the other hand, the person with the higher body surface area has a lower sweat gland density, and maybe the sweat can't merge with the sweat from the, other, from the neighboring gland, and the maximum skin wetness is proportionally lower. 
Okay, I'm running out of time, but I'll briefly describe a field study that we did, which followed on the lab study. And uh, what we want to ask the question is, maybe the more stationary nature of Lyman-specific uh, drills leads to a lower heat loss potential as well. Maybe this is something else that contributes to it. Because the, the kind of activities that backs, or this is a cornerback here, they cover a lot of ground, they run around, and the Lyman do a lot of isometric stationary work. So what we think, I'll just use this, this uh, schematic here. So this is the, the mass of air that the person is moving through. And what we think is maybe happening is that the backs that move a little quicker than the linemen there, it's not a very flattering picture of a lineman, um, maybe the amount of convection, the self-generated air velocity across the skin, and consequently the self-generated convective and heat transfer coefficient is potentially lower in those linemen because they're moving slower through, through that air. So maybe that compromises the, the uh, heat loss potential for those people. So we took seven linemen and seven non-linemen uh, that had similar physical characteristics to, uh, to, to the guys that we tested in the first study. And we, uh, it was a pretty rudimentary study. We published it in General Strength and Conditioning Research just uh, last month. Um, but we basically estimated, it's not a perfect way, I know, but we uh, estimated uh, how much ground they covered using a GPS vest, and then we extrapolated that to how we're assuming that they're going around in circles, so the self-generated air velocity, is, uh, it, that's representative of it. And then we measured skin temperature during, this is during the training camp drills using the uh, some eye buttons. And uh, subsequently, we could estimate what the maximum evaporative uh, capacity of the individual was and what their dry heat transfer was. And we can sum them together and figure out what their maximum heat loss potential is. Not actually how much heat they're losing, but how much heat they can lose. And it's, it's a rate. So briefly, I'll just uh, describe the, uh, the results. Uh, on the y-axis here, if I could take your attention to the top graph, the y-axis here is the estimated self-generated air velocity from the GPS vest. If you focus on the dotted lines here, this is the, upper, the, the mean of the upper quartile of movement. Because it's very intermittent nature, so we can't just take an average and think that's representative of what everyone's doing. It's not normally distributed, so the maximum heat loss potential is actually going to be uh, when, they're, when they're actually moving. So uh, the self-generated air velocity in the, uh, the non-linemen, or the backs, which is illustrated by the gray area, or gray circle, is significantly higher than the linemen for all these different uh, drill categories. It's only the special teams category that we didn't see any difference, and that's no great surprise, because basically everyone's just standing around, and there's just a kicker who's actually running, and maybe a pun returner who's returning kicks. So we see the, a greater self-generated uh, air velocity. Well, we see a greater movement, and we assume we've got a greater generated air velocity. But in parallel with that, we don't see any differences in skin, skin temperature between the lineman and the non-lineman. So together, we can now generate estimated rates of maximum heat loss. And if we compare the lineman and the non-lineman, we can see for all the different drill categories, the maximum heat loss is a lot lower in the lineman relative to the non-lineman. And this was repeated for all the different drill categories. And then what we can do now is saying, okay, we know how much heat they can lose. What's the maximum metabolic rate that they can work out, work at before they exceed that heat loss potential? So that's the point when we know they'll become uncompensable. Recognizing, of course, that it's an intermittent nature, uh, 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 inter intermittent sport. So then we estimated what their maximum rate of oxygen consumption could be before they exceed that maximum heat loss capacity. And due to the fact they also have different surface area to mass ratios, that's going to have a big influence as well, we found that the linemen can exercise at a much lower metabolic rate before they exceed that maximum heat loss capacity. So this might be one of the reasons why they suffer uh, greater core temperatures, uh, changes in core temperature during, um, during training camp drills. So just to summarize, uh, I know I've gone quite long, so I do apologize. Um, larger linemen appear to have a, a much lower evaporative efficiency of sweat. And we think this may be due to a lower sweat gland density. We need to do more work to isolate the influence of just body surface area, the large difference in body surface area. Um, we're pretty confident that it's got nothing to do with the fact that they are probably less fit, and we're pretty confident that it's got nothing to do with the fact that they're fatter, even though they do have to carry that fat, admittedly. Uh, a lower self-generated air velocity may also contribute to greater levels of uncompensability in, uh, in linemen as well. So what kind of practical applications can we recommend based on these data? Because ultimately, we need, we're doing this to try to give some recommendations. And we think that maybe we can specifically target larger players playing stationary positions, such as these linemen, with interventions that would A, increase skin wetterness, and B, increase convective airflow across the skin. So maybe it might be simple, as simple as not just encouraging players to drink lots of fluid, but also pour lots of fluid over themselves as well. And that would help artificially increase their skin wetterness. It might actually help cool them down somewhat. And also, if you have large portable fans that you can actually 
place next to the linemen when they're doing their stationary exercises or their stationary drills um, that might actually increase or compensate for the fact that they're moving less through that, that air mass. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and uh, we have to take any questions. Thanks. Any questions? Maybe one quick question for Ollie. Thank you. Thank you very much for your nice uh, presentation. Very interesting. Okay. When you say that Virtu Max was, uh, was not a, a d difference between uh, linemen and backs, I no. see that you express it in uh, millimeter per kilogram per minute. And uh, you say they're less fit. But V2 max sh should be expressed in a... Uh, I, 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 didn't, I didn't measure V2 max, I didn't say. I, I assumed they may be different. Ah. That last slide, what we're doing, we're taking the estimated heat loss, estimated maximal heat loss, and then we're saying, okay, how high of an oxygen consumption can you work at in mils per kilogram per minute before you exceed that maximum heat loss capacity? So we're not measuring it, we're just saying how, how much... How hard can somebody work before they exceed, the, before they become physiologically uncompensable? Yeah, but anyway, uh, as there is a big difference in, uh, body, in body mass, you should uh, express, you I should express yeah, VO2 max uh, according to allometric uh, scaling. According to what, sorry? Allometric scaling in milliliter per kilogram at the power of 0.75. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. Oh, I, I understand what you're saying. I'm fully aware how we should express VO2 max t uh, values, but um, I didn't measure VO2 max. Okay. So, but, but anyway, you, you, mentioned, you, mentioned, you mentioned it uh, two or three times during your slides uh, when uh, differentiating no, the backs and the line. No, I'm assuming that there's a difference between them. You, I think you should you should measure it because uh, the heavy the heavy body uh, heavy weight the heavy weight are uh, underestimated when you express V2 max in a meter per kilogram per minute. Uh, yeah, that's um, it. I I actually think that uh, differences in V2 max, if there are, which I'm sure I'm sure there are differences in V2 max between them. I don't think it matters. Maybe a discussion for uh, coffee. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ollie. Thanks. Uh, our next presentation's.